Prohibition. Most recently elected as Kyodam president um, this past April, and I'm very thankful and honored to be invited to this convention. Um, I'm not a good public speaker, so please bear with me, and I'm going to just give you a little background about our temple and a lot of changes that we face, as well as uh, moving forward into the future with a younger generation uh, trying to save our temple. Okay, as you can see on the screen, this is Hamakua Jodo Mission. Uh, the photo on the right is what it is today. Um, we're the oldest sanctioned Buddhist temple that was um, built in Hawaii. And um, currently, right now, we're trying to reinvigorate interest in our temple. When I first moved here, well, I was born and raised in Honokawa, first of all. I spent my adult life on the Wahoo. I was a real estate agent for my adult career. In 2018, I moved back to the Big Island when my parents passed on. And I've been attending this uh, temple since I was a little child. And uh, honestly, you know, when you're growing up, you really don't pay attention. You know, you just tag along with your parents and you know, everything's in Japanese. I don't understand. Sorry, I don't understand Japanese or I don't speak it also. So everything was pretty Greek to me. I just remember going there, following my parents, you know, during the time, you know, going to the bond dance and um, the services in between. But after moving back, I was approached by an elderly member who was in his 80s. His name was Masa Nishimori. He was the Kyodan president for many years at our temple. He was basically uh, the life of the temple. He did everything from maintenance, um, board-related matters. I mean, it was just like basically one guy with five other elderly people that were taking care of the temple. If you can imagine an 83-year-old man climbing up on the ladder, trimming trees, um, doing the yard work. Our property spans about three acres. So you can believe like an 80 something year old guy doing this by himself. So when I moved back, he approached me because he was a family friend also. And he said that the treasurer passed away suddenly. And would I be interested in coming the treasurer? <coughs> At that time, I admitted to him, I'm, you know, I was raised as a Buddhist, but I don't know a, a lot of things. And that I was willing to learn and help him out because um, besides himself, there was five other elderly people. Their average age was 86 years old. They were doing everything. So I made a promise to them that I would help and see what I could do. And taking over that treasure job, I was quite shocked that a lot of things haven't been modernized. Everything was old school. And you know, back in the old days, everything was like a handshake agreement or you know, a small group of people helping out. They were ashamed to ask for help. There was no fundraising done in decades. So when I went over the things I acquired as treasure, they gave me a cardboard box of oh, this size. <laughs> and then I'm like, where's everything else? This temple has been alive for over 100 years. He said, no, this is everything in a box. <laughs> and in looking at everything, I found out, wow, I have a big job ahead of me. And it has been a journey from that day moving forward. And finding that I've been trying to get things modern and technology was a no-go for them. All of them were, didn't own a computer, didn't know anything about the internet. And it's been a long haul, but over the years, um, I've tried to get um, fundraising events going on a smaller scale to introduce that so people get used to it. Because when I first stepped in the fold, everybody thought I was a city slipper. You know, they said, oh, that's a lot to absorb right now. Or why are you doing this? Everything's been doing fine. But I told them, the way we've been running, we're going to go bankrupt. I mean, how have we been existing? They've been dipping into their savings. And little by little, that has been exhausted. So I said, if there's no money coming in, how can we survive? You know, all our money is being completed as far as our savings. So as soon as I started, I aggressively started a donation drive campaign. Because we had a lot of 
um, expenses, maintenance that has been neglected over the years. So um, I've been trying to get like a little modernization and baby steps so people don't get scared off right away. But of course with that, we do get criticism. You know, trying to move forward when everything's been a certain way for so long. So my main goal is trying to get the community involved in our temple. So, you know, like previously, our temple was, it's like a little secret. We're in the Kalukamato area, where it's kind of tucked away from the main highway. So a lot of people, even Kama'aina, doesn't realize that this magnificent temple that's one of the most architecturally significant buildings in the state. They don't know it exists. So one of the goals is to make our history known to the public. That means educating the younger generation of our temple, the people who are behind the building of this. Because ultimately what I feel is um, we're a people's members temple. It was built by the members, it was sustained by the members for all these years, and hopefully in the future we'll keep going that way. So, a lot of people who do come to visit, um, they're either students, uh, tourists who find out about us through the internet, you know, they're interested about our history, as well as um, people seeking out information about Katsuboto, which I'll get into later on in this presentation. And um, we've been getting a lot of student groups, which we try to encourage. And we've had uh, groups from the University of Hawaii. We just had a Japanese school called the Pokiwagi um, High School in Japan. It's an all-girls school that recently came over. And they were very fascinated about how our temple was built, as well as um, the story of Katsuboto. So trying to get the education part out there and the history, because for myself, I did not know much about our temple. My dad always told me that there's a lot of history in that it's the oldest section of temple on, on the Big Island. But in learning more, I found out that our immigrants sacrificed a lot to build it during that time, and it was a labor of love, and I'd like to keep that um, labor of love going on into um, you know, modern times. Okay, you can get to the next slide, please. Okay, so what I'm gonna cover is a little history of our temple, our current state of our membership, and problem solving. I know a lot of you know the definition of shogunai, that's that expression that a lot of older Japanese people use. My parents use that quite a bit. And I'm going to do a little intro of our executive team. That's our board of directors. We, um, this past April, we held an election. And it's the first time that we have a full board. We have seven positions where all seven positions are taken. And the average age of our board of directors is 48 years old. So it's very new. Because in the past, our board has always been people in their 80s and 90s. And I'm going to talk about embracing our you know, community and change, and also educating the younger generation. OK, so next slide. So um, our temple is historically significant in that in 1896, our first temple was built. Um, Reverend Gakuo Okabe arrived from Japan in 1894 and he spread the teachings of uh, Buddhism. There was no temple anywhere. So what happened was um, as he went to house to house and taught the teachings of Buddhism, a lot of the immigrants felt that they should have a temple of worship. So what happened was um, they uh, got together, they fundraised, you know, people went not door to door, you know, seeking donations and, you know, help from volunteers. And our temple was built in 1896. Today, that temple still stands. It's now used as our dining hall and kitchen. And the cost to build that temple was $3,000. So you can imagine that was big money back then. 
So, you know, they put in a lot of effort to try and get this um, temple built. Okay, next slide. When I first moved back, our membership, there was only 28 active members. Of the 28 active members, just only six of them, which were elderly people in the 80s and 90s that were helping as well as volunteering, participating in services, and you know, day by day maintenance. And myself and my boyfriend moved back, so that number became to eight people. <laughs> And we're, we're saying, oh, if we could just get somebody to come and help. And Masa, our former president, um, he would say, you know, I sit here on the stairs after my work, and, you know, it's so sad that nobody ever comes by. Because he would be there from, like, about 7.30 in the morning to, like, lunchtime, where he would go home and, you know, take a siesta at that time. But um, back when it first started, of course, our membership was up to about 600 people. That was when the active plantation, you know, days were going on. So you can see the dramatic drop off. And I told them, we need to get more members. And if not members, we need to get volunteers or any human bodies that show an interest to come and help us. Because, you know, as far as the majority, they're elderly. So what will happen when they pass on? It's only going to be myself and my boyfriend. And, um, so we've been trying to get new membership. It's been a slow process, but in 2023, five years later, we're up to 60. Oh. And a lot of them are descendants of you know, former members that they weren't aware of the struggles of our temple. And um, we, so we've got a, quite a lot of new ones, as well as uh, people who are not Buddhist. We've had people in the community who's very into historical preservation issues, and um, they just love the place when they come up there. So they're willing to help volunteer, and some of them even join because they want they see the struggles that if nobody else does, we might be something you know of the past that we couldn't continue. Of the sixty people, we have about twenty-two active members who come on a regular basis, volunteer with our cemetery cleanups, and um, you know, help with the day-by-day -day runnings of our temple. And though six are honorary members where they don't pay membership, I mean, they're still a member, but they just do not have voting rights when we have um, meetings. And as far as the 22, a lot of our members are live off island or live on the mainland. So that number would be higher if we did have more people from the Big Island. But when it comes to times of meetings or when we need some kind of vote, um, almost 85% of the people do vote on the um, issues at hand. Okay, next slide. Okay, problem solving. A lot of things I found out is in the past, they have that shogunite uh, response to it. It can't be helped. You know, so a lot of times I would bring up at meetings, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that in order to move forward. And a lot of them say, well, we haven't done that in the past so many years. Why should we need, why should we need fire insurance? <laughs> why do we need general liability insurance? And I have to explain, we're not in the same decade of the past where, you know, we're in a soon happy world and, you know, modern times, you know, there's different things that we have to look at. And getting over that attitude of it can't be helped or it is what it is, you know. Oh, well, we don't have membership. I guess, you know, Hamako Jodo will be, you know, history. You know, there's nobody else. But I've been trying to get across that, yes, we can change that we can control our reactions to our favorable situations by, you know, taking that word and realize that we do, uh, we can control our reaction to unfavorable situations, which is what exactly we can 
in that we'll address problems as they come along and not turn up, turn away. Those problems just lead to more problems. And one of our elderly members told me, oh well, Sandy, you know, I'm in my golden years right now, so you know, I don't want to deal with it. When I'm gone, you guys can address, you know, who get the problem. That they didn't want to get into it. And I don't blame them because once I did get into problem solving, you know, a lot of things take a lot of time, you know, phone calls, administrative work, and um, it's just something you have to just bite your tongue and you just do it. You know, you have to um, have that gambate attitude where we must pers persevere, speak out against what um, things are wrong, and that we have the mindset that we will no longer accept things if we know that wrong things can be righted just by simple research and just asking for help. I know there is pride that it's hard to ask for help. And you know, even like a donation drive, some people were kind of hesitant to ask people for money. I even went out to local businesses and asked them if they could kindly you know, donate to us and explain our situation. And you know, to our amazement, there was a lot of um, good feedback. We did raise about $25,000, and that was like um, very impressive that we we're able to do that because once they learn about the history and the people, the elders who are running it, they're really well respected in the community. So people really open up their hearts to us. So we like to continue that and just have that kambake um, attitude that we have to persevere. And uh, things aren't always going to be rosy, but you know, if we all work together, we can somehow overcome. Cannot um, say without trying. Next slide, please. So this is our new board of directors. We call the executive team. Our youngest member is 19 years old. Her, let me see, her, her great grandfather was one of the men who helped build our temple. And he was the construction foreman. So she, along with her mom, Crystal, uh, they're both uh, members of our board right now. Our oldest member is 66 years old. So and as you can see, we're an all-female team, so that was something to wrap the kids around because, you know, that's you. Because we're in a samurai world, right? Sometimes where, you know, the man is dominant, but I'm the first female Kyodan president in the history of the temple. So it's, for some people, it's a lot to absorb, but we feel very confident. We've accomplished a lot since taking office in April. And we are, our mindset is a lot more modern than the average elder temple, and um, we hope for a very bright future. Next slide. Okay, so embracing changing times. One of the problems at our temple is our services is still conducted in Japanese. And a lot of um, younger people who attend services we don't understand what's being you know, preached or what, what the service means, the, uh, the context behind the service. You know, when I moved back, I'm the first to admit, I didn't know all the different types of service, what the significance was. And I did over time learn you know, that we observe like Ojuya, Hanamatsuri, you know, of course, Oman, which most people are familiar with, but there is a lot more and I feel that we should move towards modern times and having English incorporated in order to get the younger members involved. Because I've had some that told me that they would like to attend services, but they don't understand anything what's going on. And I, I think very highly of your temples because you folks do a lot of things in English. You know, so people can learn the significance of why we honor certain like celebrations and whatnot. And this past Obon was very interesting because um, we had a guest minister, uh, Reverend John Hara from Waiuku um, Jojo Mission. He was our guest speaker and he's younger. And before you know we actually got into the service, 
he would explain, okay, we're going to do this and the significance of why we're doing it. And he explained what's going to happen throughout the service. And we had uh, quite a lot of young people in there because of Hops and Bone, you know, the families come with their, you know, family members. And after the service, I had uh, a person come up to me. Her family has been members for many generations. And her children are in their like, late 20s, early 30s. And she thanked me. And she said, oh, you know, for the first time, my kids were very happy that they could understand what was being Talk, you know, as far as the significance to you behind what is a one, it's not just a one dance, it's the, you know, the honoring our ancestors whose spirits return during a one season. So she was very touched that, you know, that her kids were happy to actually be at the service and they came away with a better, better understanding about Buddhism. So I think we should, um, as far as the Jodo Shu, move in that direction and adopt. You know, maybe on a slow basis, so that people don't get overwhelmed at once. But you know, I give my hats off to the program G for introducing that. So that way, we can entice younger people to come in and um, help keep uh, Buddhism alive. Next slide. Okay. As far as educating the younger generation, as you see here, there's a panel that explains a little about our history of our temple. We use this as an educational tool. So when we have visiting groups come over, um, they can kind of get a general idea of the main people who helped build our temple as well as any um, significant events during the duration of our existence. And um, this ed educational tool is something that we like to expand on in the future on um, different, um, you know, right now it's just a broad history of important people. However, we want to expand like um, Katsuboto might have one, as well as, you know, like a significant uh, person from the temple's history, you know, to highlight and change it quite often. So there's always something new to learn and engage people. Okay, next sounds like. <coughs> Okay, when I, we first um, moved back to the Big Island, we did not have any online presence. You know, what is Hamako Jojo? Where are we located? How can we find out more information? So what I did was I built our own website. I'm not a web master by any means, but I, through trial and error, I made a website, which is one of the largest ways that we can um, get our history out. And we get quite a lot of people who contact us through our website wanting to schedule visits to a temple or a tour group. So uh, it's been really helpful in uh, connecting with people not only in Hawaii but overseas. We also have a second website called the History Pin. What that was, um, it became a reality through the North Hawaii Educational Research Center in Honoka. Um, I got involved volunteering, it's like the Heritage Center, and I got involved with them and they approached me if I would be interested in um, doing a website that's connected to their main one through History Pin. It's kind of like an Instagram where you post all kinds of pictures and people can learn a little about the temple. It's sort of interactive too. So if somebody came to the big island and they're like, oh, I'm in the front of the temple stairs, you can, there's the ability where you can map yourself onto the um, actual website that you were there, that, at that location, like pin your um, lookout. So this has been a great um, help to us in getting our history out and people are becoming more aware of us through um, the websites. Social media is another one that we're going to be opening up to. Our youngest member is 19, so she's always on the computer because, you know, she's of that generation that's tech savvy. So she's in the process of opening a Facebook and Instagram account for us where we can um, keep people up to date on a regular basis of all the events that are coming up or little tidbits about our temple. Um, next slide. 
and official newsletters. This has been a great way of getting information out to our members, donors, and volunteers, as well as friends in the community. When I first moved back, we had a, a newsletter. It was a one-page newsletter. Didn't have any news, basically, just what the <laughs> services are, who donated money that month, and that was it. And it was shocking in that a lot of people were not aware of what's going on at our temple. We're currently in negotiations with Kamehameha Schools to purchase the land that the temple sits on. It's been a long process, and it's probably going to be a lot more years before that gets solidified, but um, many of our members didn't even know that that was even happening. You know, that's how out of touch everybody was. So what happened was um, about a year ago, we formed a newsletter committee and our membership voted that we're going to have a newsletter that's written by the members for the people. So in it, we tried to incorporate news, little historical facts so people can learn about the temple at the same time. But we also remember our elders who gave a lot of their time and devotion. And we feature like flashback photos of the past, as well as feature like volunteer of the month, as well as uh, members of our temple. Um, next slide. And visitor tours. We do a lot of tours at our temple. And this picture here is a uh, University of Hawaii class who, else, who also ended up um, volunteering about half an hour of their time of um, helping clean up the, uh, the grounds, and pick up dead leaves, raking, and whatnot. We also had Kenny Endo and his ensemble contact us wanting to um, come take a visit. So Mr. Endo, his wife, and two other people from his group came over, and we had like a taiko drum tucked away in the back of our temple for many years. So he taught us how to store it, and they gave, they gave a taiko demonstration. So we have a lot of people that come over. We had Hawaii celebrities as well as students, a lot from Japan. We currently have on the schedule um, Reverend Yoshida. If you, when you have time, if you refer to that um, display board, he was the fourth minister at Hamakua Jodo Mission, and he oversaw the building of our kompono, our main temple. His great, great, great grandson is coming to Hawaii with his family members next month. There are going to be seven of them from Japan, and they like to you know, come and see the temple as well as learn a little bit more about Hamako Jodo Mission. He mentioned that he, um, his grandfather used to talk about Hamako Jodo Mission a lot, and it's been passed down through generations. So they like to come and see what, you know, what this temple is about and, you know, see what their ancestor um, oversaw and built. Next slide. What we incorporated is a cemetery cleanup day. You know, getting volunteers is a really tough thing to do. So what happened was um, basically Masa who was 83 years old, he used to take care of the cemetery by himself. You can imagine an 80 something year old guy with a knapsack of poison, poisoning the cemetery. I mean, every day he would do a little section at a time. And when he passed away, we were like, what are we going to do? There's nobody retired that can come here on every single day and work on, you know, taking care of the weeds because they grow like crazy. And um, through Akiko Masuda of um, Hakala, she has a cemetery stewardship. I've been in touch with her since I basically moved back to the Big Island, trying to see if her stewardship could take on Hakako Joto. At that time, they had multiple cemeteries they were taking care of. And she said, oh, they didn't have enough volunteers to add us on to their list. So what happened is, um, through perseverance, kept working her and working, you know, I kept that connection alive. And finally, we had an opportunity to get on their list of uh, cleanups. So they meet on the fourth Sunday of each month. And now it's kind of taking a life of its own, where we've had more volunteers from the community that
that is not allowed about it, that they come and come join us in um, cleaning the cemetery. Um, next slide. So as you can see, these are some of the projects. You know, it's not only weeding. You know, they um, cut down tree limbs. They um, clean the gravestones. And um, we have Liam, our youngest volunteer. He's only six years old, and um, he tags along and he does his best for a six-year-old. What a six-year-old can do, but he's happily takes up uh, buckets of weeds, dumps it off in the gulch and whatnot. But we're trying to teach people, younger people, the importance of not forgetting the people who helped us live a better life. You know, our ancestors who sacrificed a lot. So he comes to every cleanup we have and he helps in his own way from making sandwiches, help making sandwiches to um, dumping weeds that the um, others pull. So we are hopeful that this will continue. We also have a duo of teenagers. They're like about 15 and 16 years old that also come along. So we're very um, encouraged that they like to help and at the same time they're learning about the temple. And it would be surprising that somebody like Liam who's six years old, he told me, oh, we can't forget, you know, Uncle Masa. You know, he remembers seeing Masa working hard and he gets that message. So that's our goal is to get um, the younger ones in that mindset. Our next slide. So he became like an unofficial labor union leader. <laughs> And, you know, they deemed him as a troublemaker because, you know, he would say, oh, no, 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 that, you know, our people need this or, you know, um, the tensions rose so high that, you know, he was lynched in Honoka Akao. And um, we like to um, honor his legacy because he was a man ahead of his time and um, people need to... Um, learn about his life when he moved over here to Hawaii, what um, challenges he faced, and you know, we need to um, learn how to be tolerant of other people's um, race, as well as, you know, be open and receptive to, you know, new people. New Andy, people. could you please put the mic forward okay. to, so we can hear you, we can't hear okay. you. All right, sorry about that. So what happened was, um, we're trying to get uh, more educational programs. So that's in the mix. So this um, coming week, we're having uh, Katsukolu Legacy Week where we're gonna have a memorial service at our temple. Uh, Reverend uh, Masanari Yamagishi of Monoka Ahungaji is gonna be officiating that service. So um, we're gonna have that. We're gonna welcome some guests from Japan as well as um, there's going to be some peace festival uh, activities in Honokaha that will follow after that um, ceremony. And that's about it. I'm just, sorry, this is new to me and I've never spoken in front of a crowd before, so uh, I appreciate your attention and hopefully you take a look at our um, display board. We do have some um, copies of our, our two most popular editions of our news letter as well as complimentary postcards and other brochures. Thank you.